Hey boys and girls, welcome to uh, Monroe Live. We're, uh, we're here at Nicola, and I uh, said in the past that I'm kind of interested in uh, hydrogen when it comes to trucks. So in back of me, uh, if you have a look, you can see the beginnings of a factory. So the, uh, the Nicola factory seems to be in uh, really good shape as far as, um, as, far as where it is. Um, from a timing standpoint. This is their 0 0.5 uh, factory. If we look over there, we can see that um, there's uh, little curtains in one knot. That means it's a removable wall. So this is their first phase to get things rolling and then they'll move out uh, to the east of us here and, um, and make, uh, make things happen. Today, I've got uh, Jason Reut, and um, Jason is uh, going to give us uh, some of the tour here today, and Christian uh, will be, uh, will be uh, also coming along. We're going to be giving you a little bit of a tour. I'm kind of excited to be here. I'm surprised at uh, how far down the line everything is, so let's go and uh, have a look. Okay, so we're heading for, uh, for a fueling station here. So we're gonna have a look at uh, what the truck looks like uh, when, it's being, uh, when it's being fueled up. And if you have a look at it with the, uh, this is an Alpha vehicle? This is alpha. one of our Alphas, yep. Huh. Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> that's a lot further along than I'd normally expect to see. Uh, this actually, does not look like an Alpha vehicle. This is uh, almost like pre-production. This is in, normally a company won't, uh, won't go this far. You must be using all the same tooling or a lot of the same tooling. We are, so we built seven in total of these Alpha trucks. And uh, like we said before, it isn't a normal way to do it, but we want to get out on the road as soon as possible because we have a lot to validate and a lot to learn. But we're also able to leverage a lot of the work that's been done on our battery electric vehicle. And you can see here, and Christian can walk you through how we've integrated yeah. the fuel cell, how we've integrated the tanks, and uh, you can kind of get an appreciation for that. So as, as Jason said, we're using a lot of the same parts as we're using for our Beth which um, you saw inside yeah. um, on the line. We're using the same cap structure here for our Alpha builds. We're using the basic, uh, basically the same chassis structure, the frame. If you look to the rear of the vehicle, um, <coughs> essentially everything from here onwards, the rear axle, the E-axle that sits here, the additional tag axle, the integration of the inverters of the high voltage distribution box um, is exactly the same as in our battery electric truck. Um, mm. And then instead of the essentially three re rows of batteries, we're uh, integrating two hydrogen tanks on the saddle locations. Um, so one on this side, one on the other one, and then three more tanks um, in what we call the backpack. Those tanks are each um, the same size, uh, 600 millimeter diameter tanks, about two meters long. Um, and each of those tanks in, in the current version hold about uh, 12 kilograms, a little bit more, and then for production, those tanks um, we will increase the efficiency. So sticking with the same outer dimensions, but mm. increase the storage efficiency to be able to store about 14 kilograms. And what um, would that convert to uh, in uh, miles? So for based on you know average flat driving, whatever. Yeah. So based on uh, the uh, reference cycles that we use, so we use bunch of different cycles to ref essentially reflect kind of an average consumption of the trucks in these uh, regional applications and uh, we're projecting over 500 miles of range. 500 miles of range production. for Yeah, one, one of the of differences in uh, commercial vehicles versus passenger cars, you get so many different applications that you can use commercial yeah. trucks <coughs> on. So there isn't a really good like standard that people use for fuel economy even on a diesel. But like Christian said, we, we project to get between seven and eight miles per kilogram. That's kind of the rough math. So, you know, when Christian talks about 14 kilo kilos in a tank, that's the rough math. And, and again, it just depends on the physics of the truck, the hauling, the physics of yeah. the speed, the Grade. inclination, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, um, I hear this all the time, I, and I already know what the answer is, but I know a lot of people would be very interested. Um, this is the tank itself here, mm -hmm. and um, um, in essence, people say, oh my God, what happens if one of those tank ruptures and explodes? And now, when I was working with NASA, uh, we developed a tank, and uh, the test was they ran it, they parked it on a train track and ran into it at about, I don't know, 60 miles an hour with a train. Mm -hmm. And they bounced free and they broke uh, the truck to smithereens and whatnot, but the tanks were the same. So why don't you give us a little lowdown on, um, on the testing or validation or whatever that goes into these tanks and those ones up there. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is a very important topic um, in general for us, safety. So, um, and this is, by the way, something which we will change a little bit going forward, going beyond our alpha trucks. You can see a fairly massive structure here um, that's essentially to, to protect the, the vehicle and the tanks from a crash. We do have a crash detection system. So once we detect the crash, we not only um, cut the high voltage, we also um, make sure we close all of the valves so we don't have any hydrogen um, being mm. able to leak from any of the lines. Now, <clears throat> with the crash, we have specific requirements that the tanks um, should not leak post-crash. Um, and we also have uh, the requirements that they stay on board of the vehicle. And that's what we're ensuring by the structure and by all of the testing. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. in fact done already the second iteration of live crash tests um, on this Alpha truck, which is um, probably also not very usual, but in order to be able to, ha to verify that we have a fairly mature build here. Yeah. Um, in terms of the testing on the tanks itself, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of testing that we, we do even before we install these tanks on the vehicle. Um, one of the tests is actually that we um, fire a high caliber at the tank and then mm -hmm. the requirement is that we don't have any bursting but we have an uncontrolled venting. Um, mm. Part of the truck assembly and the system integration are also vent lines that are directed um, to the top of the truck. So in case we have to vent, we're able to do that up and away and yeah. hydrogen off obviously you know yeah, floats yeah. floats away fairly yeah. quickly um, and, th and those are only a few of the tests we're doing we're doing um, a test of uh, f external fire exposure of the tanks yeah. um, doing drop tests um, and obviously doing a lot of cycling tests to also ensure that the tanks are qualified for mm. the usage um, and uh, the lifetime that we design it for and there well, is a ballistic test sandy that yeah. they do Mention that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the ballistic test. Yeah. I was just going to ask ballistic about test. that. So I have a lot of guys that are, um, um, like myself, hunters. Mm -hmm. So what do you fire into this? A 30 out six, or what is it that you use for your uh, your um, your rifle test? Uh, I need to double check with with our hydrogen uh, oh. tank. I mean, you didn't do it. Oh, we, geez, we did Christian. Do it. I thought for sure. <laughs> Christian's not a good shot. We need no. a repeatable test. I'll repeat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We're not cutting that part out, boys. <laughs> I'll, I'll get that information to you. <laughs> okay, but, that'd uh, be great. I know we had to shoot actually twice to even get it to uh, penetrate. Yeah, penetrate that's why I was saying. Um, um, event, yeah. so. But this, these are these are 700 bar tanks. So there's yep. a lot of uh, prototypes out on the road. They're using the 350 bar tanks. Yes. Mm. But uh, you can see they're they're carbon fiber wound. They're they're yeah. about the most robust thing on the vehicle. Yeah. You know, yeah. like Christian said, when we do the crash test, we even do it without the the side protection just to check the behavior. You know, yeah. and, and Christian mentioned the venting system. One of the one of the interesting things, if you compare hydrogen and natural gas, hydrogen is so light that you know when we do yeah. vent, uh, we're it twenty or quick. thirty feet up yeah. in the air in a matter of seconds versus having a gas leak that's coagulating yeah. down on the yeah. the ground level. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know a fair amount about natural gas. I worked mm -hmm. on a couple of engines with Ford to try and see what we could do to convert to natural gas. So I'm, I'm aware of what can happen with that. But yeah. this, this is a totally different ball game. You'll so notice you the tanks are a lot bigger in diameter than maybe what yeah. you've seen right. too. Well, that, the ones yeah. that, I, that we worked on at NASA are like as okay, long well, as the truck. Well, if we're and comparing them to a rocket tanks, in diameter. Then, yeah, you, you win, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, they, they uh, they're auxiliary tanks. They don't <laughs> they don't they don't take up rockets. But that that technique, the the winding technique, and I can see it from the side yep. here. The winding technique was all developed at NASA. Uh, your tax dollars are at work. <laughs> yeah. So this looks pretty good. 
So actually, a lot of the exposed wires here that you see, or all of the well, I was going to ask about this. Looks like testing. It's all equipment. instrumentation equipment. Yeah. So this is one of the trucks we uh, heavily instrumented for thermal testing. Yeah. So you'll see the additional equipment here in the back. You'll see all of the wiring that extends actually here. But again, those are all yeah. additional sensors, the thermal but couples, even, even all of the actual wiring of the truck. Um, that's all pretty clean. Laying on the uh, laying on a on the frame. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I don't usually see this much um, care taken in a, in an Alpha vehicle. I mean, normally it's just black tape, or you know, we don't. They don't even waste time with uh, with uh, wire ties. Yeah. But this looks very very neat. Mm. My favorite connectors. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not a fan of connectors, but if I'm going to have them, that's that's the kind I would go with. Yeah, they're they're pretty robust. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're you're familiar with it, Sandy, but maybe some of your your viewers aren't. I mean, this is basically instrumented, like Christian said, with probably over a hundred channels of uh, oh. accelerometers, temperature sensors. Right. So yeah. it's it's almost like you know if you went to a doctor and had a stress test. When we're mm. going out and validating, we're measuring every possible thing we can for numerous reasons. One, to yeah. see what happens in the real world. Like I mentioned, there isn't a standard use and we'll be putting these trucks in service hauling beer. We'll be putting them in the ports in, in yeah. LA and Long Beach. The other the other thing too is to just correlate what we've done on the test. And it's, it's very important for all yeah. of those things in this phase. Yeah. yeah. So this is the heart um, of the truck, I would say, the fuel cell system. Yeah. You can see it's a, what we call twin box. Um, meaning you have two independent fuel cell systems, um, two stacks with their own separate balance of plant, their old, own uh, air intake, exhaust, um, and electrical connections, and as well as cooling. Um, they're tied together with a backbone, um, so it's one assembly that's being essentially dropped into the vehicle. Mm. At, in this case, it's a cap over design, so it's in a place where you would normally find the diesel engine. Yeah. Each of these systems have a, has a power output of 100 kilowatt. That's net power output, so that's the power that actually goes into the vehicle. That's already subtracting for all of the uh, consumers that are needed to drive the fuel cell system, like the air compressor. That's why we refer to it as net power. And we're also designing that to be the end of life net power, meaning this is what the truck will do after you know seven years of service, after oh, 20,000, oh. 25,000 hours. Um, of service, we still want to have these 200 kilowatt as a system output power to be so able to have the truck perform essentially yeah. in the same way it did on the first day on its last day of service. So what, what are you looking at in miles? Because mo normally uh, two things. Number one, um, can you quickly uh, convert um, kilowatts to um, horsepower and so that half the people do not understand metric at all. That'd be one thing. And then the second thing is, how many miles do you expect this truck to, uh, to be in service? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, horsepower, uh, 100 kilowatt, um, is roughly 135 um, horsepower. So we're looking into around 270 horsepowers. Um, and then, <clears throat> In terms of the mileage, it always depends on the application, right, of the truck. So we have some applications we're targeting, like drayage, where we have more hours and uptime. We have less mileage accumulated. Um, but then there's typical regional haul applications that do a fairly high average speed of maybe 35 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour. So I would say it can equate anywhere between um, 700,000 and a million miles that were. Uh, well, a million miles is like the basic that uh, that most truck drivers are going to be looking right. for. Right. Yeah. They they want to see that they can get their monies out in a, in a million miles. Well, Absolutely. Christian mentioned the net power. You know, one of the one of the interesting things about this market in particular is you're right, Sandy. You know, a million miles is a good target for lifetime. But typically, you know, what happens in diesel and natural gas is after about five or six years, you start to get out of warranty, your fuel economy starts to drop, and it's really all about how much money can you make when you're, when you're hauling loads mm -hmm. in these trucks. So it, it actually becomes one of the interesting advantages uh, for a fuel cell because it, it, it ages differently. 
So, you know, as this fuel cell ages and the, the chemicals, you know, become less efficient, we, we have a degradation in power. But like Christian said, that's why we like to talk about the net power, because we don't want to spec the trucks that, you know, eight years or seven years into the life, there'll be a, a degradation of what they can do. And that's a pretty big difference in commercial vehicles versus battery, you know, because batteries do age. And when batteries age, you lose your state of health and eventually you'll have less range, uh, even, even on the commercial yeah. Vehicles right. now on a passenger car that's not going to be as noticeable. <coughs> yeah. But you know when we're stressing these heavy-duty vehicles, trying to pull you know 82,000 pounds gross combined vehicle weight, you know your, your every mile is 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 pretty important. Um, so we believe that that's going to eventually be a, a differentiator for the fuel cell powertrain. That that we will have a let's call it a reliable. 10 year, a million mile life without a significant degradation in the performance. Mm. And, and to be honest, we, we need that because you know you, you can see this is going to be a more expensive vehicle than, than a diesel vehicle. But if we can ensure that it, it lasts reliably twice as long, now that's why yeah. I would say, you know, yeah, there's trucks on the road that are 10 years old, but they get less and less and less well, you, you fuel got, economy. You, you yeah. got something else that you have to take into account and that's um, that's a uh, 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 life cycle cost. Mm -hmm. So the whole life cycle, and that's where this well, it should be something that uh, that should come out as being less expensive, mm -hmm. and because you have no transmission, yep. you have no um, uh, no engine that's going to require yep. oil and yep. all kinds of maintenance. And usually, after about a half a million miles, the engines get pulled and they get rebuilt and they get yep. put back in. Yep. Somewhere between a half, it depends on who's doing the, mm -hmm. the hauling and how they haul and whatnot, but half a million at the low end, three quarters at the high end, yeah. uh, nobody gets really beyond that. Yeah, uh, and, and you, an you mentioned you know, the, the maintenance. So you know, that, that's one of the, the disadvantages of today's diesel for heavy duty is the after treatment, you know, yeah. the, the, the particulate filter, the NOx, all of that just becomes a lot more problem, problematic for maintenance costs. So there's really yeah. two reasons why, you know, the, the, big, the big fleets kind of turn their trucks over after five years. You know, one, you're getting out of the, the warranty zone right. and into some expensive maintenance yeah, costs. Right. And two, you start to lose, you know, you lose 5% fuel economy. That's a, that's a difference between Huge. your company making profit and not. And not, yes, yeah. and, that's, and that's the truth. So mm -hmm. anyway, this looks pretty good. Um, I got to tell you, it, it doesn't look like an Alpha vehicle to me, and I don't think it would to anybody else either. And Happy I've seen lots of, uh, <coughs> lots of, lots of, uh, lots of trucks. Yeah. So, um, tell you what, um, I didn't see anything to do with the actual fueling. I assume it's on the other side. Yeah. Can we yep. swing around yeah. and take a Let's look? Let's go around. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's pretty interesting though how much uh, room yeah, you have cool to look idea. at everything in the cab over, huh? We should articulate it first, Andy. That's always so. cool. I like it when it transforms. Well, it takes let's a while. Take, uh, let's take that out first. Anyhow, <laughs> so uh, we have essentially a, a trailer here to do um, a mobile fueling here. That's, as mm -hmm. I said, for our first fueling. Um, uh, we also do a, a purge of the system first. Um, so we do a few cycles um, on this fueling. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, we give it a first. Um, fueling to uh, fire up the fuel cell system for the first time. This hasn't happened on this vehicle yet, but we have the other vehicles already in operation and on the test tracks. Um, and then as you will see inside, we have uh, two more vehicles that are um, about to be um, finished from an electrical point of view, and then we'll go into the fueling here as well. So what's the time, to, how much time does it take to fuel the truck? Yeah. So <clears throat> we're working together with an industry group as well as some international consortiums um, we're working together with uh, some of the activities happening in Europe um, as well as here. ISO standardization efforts, um, some in my team are actually leading some of the working groups. And um, uh, what we're trying to do is essentially establish a new standard for heavy duty fueling for 700 bar. Um, essentially a fast fueling with the current um, standards um, and equipment that we have. Um, we're looking into fueling times of this truck uh, for a 700 bar of about an hour or so. Mm. What we're doing with uh, the new equipment we're developing, as well as the uh, protocols, the new protocols, um, and yeah. safe <coughs> communication between the vehicle and the station and so on, we're uh, targeting 
uh, for this truck around 10 minutes of fueling time. Hmm. Yeah, just, just to be clear with that, the, the reason why <laughs> it's, it's, it's closer to an hour is mainly to do with the pressure available from the mobile units like what you see behind Christian there. Well, it's yeah. other, the other thing is volume. This is yeah. a really small pipe. Yeah. yeah. Um, here, here we're not, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Well, anyway, that's the size pipe I would normally think you're going to be coming in with. Yeah. If you could come in with something that size, this yeah. should be... You should go uh, quite a bit fast. You should be able to drop it down to 15 minutes if you can go to something bigger. Is that the, is that the stuff it, you're talking it's about? It's part of it. So as I said, the equipment is part of it. So the actual hose, um, the nozzle and the receptacle, um, those are part of uh, what's currently limiting the fueling speed. So that has just to do with the dimensioning of these parts. Um, yeah. And that's where we're working with the industry consortium. To, uh, to develop the new hardware. And then the second part is, while we're doing this, we also need a closer monitoring and communication between the vehicle and the station. So continuous mm -hmm. flow of information, flows, um, as well as temperatures, pressure levels, um, in order to maximize the fueling speed. Yeah. Um, but we're very confident to you know, achieve a significant improvement there. Um, in the yeah. fueling times. Um, and we're not alone, as I said. I mean, we're driving towards that um, with, with all of our partners and are very confident to achieve the, mm. the targeted fueling speed. Yeah, we're, we, won't be, we won't be unique. Uh, everything we'll do, our, our trucks will be able to fuel any place that has this, these standard nozzles and vice versa at our fueling stations with the other OEMs that are, are involved in it as well. Mm. Well, I know that if I was going to look at a standard, I'd be looking at the size of that pipe over there. Yep. <laughs> and normally, I wouldn't see something that I could hand hold. Normally, this thing is on like a cradle or something, and you get it close, and it does the rest of its business all by itself. So mm. I'm assuming it'd be like a, either an automatic or a semi-automatic fueling station. So we're, uh, we're also looking into that. Um, good that you mentioned it. Um, we're looking into semi-automatic or automatic fueling. Um, but as a baseline, we will have a, essentially a, a device you can uh, use manually. Oh, okay. Hopefully, uh, whatever this is, uh, it'll get bolted in sometime. Yeah. <laughs> they, they do have a bracket. We're actually uh, having them pulled out a little bit to have better accessibility in case we need to um, connect a, a breakout box. Um, yeah. But they all have mounts. Yeah, um, Christian and the team the have given you full access to the alpha so uh don't nitpick it too much but we do appreciate your uh, <laughs> your your uh your yeah help if you want nit opinions. that's uh <laughs> that's uh that's that's my middle name nitpick. <laughs> so. i'm actually very interested very. in any feedback you want to you want to give us to, yeah. well, to the build, right so. now it's mostly good i i like i say this isn't what i'm expecting to see for an alpha product and uh hmm. Be nice to see that bolted together before you start it up, whatever it might be. Yeah. Yep. Usually, if I was in an Alpha vehicle and I had something like that, it'd have a red tag on it, or it'd be painted red or something. Yep. Uh, so that's that's about it for me. But as far as closing it up, if you're still fueling, I'm not interested in uh, uh, well, we wasting a lot of your time. We can yeah. we can we'll show see you that it tomorrow yeah. inside. Yeah. yeah. You can see yeah. it on the battery electrics too. But yep. it's, it's interesting, you know, uh, not a lot of people have seen the European cab over style, but it's amazing how, yeah. how much access you can get to, to yeah. all the equipment with this design. Right. Well, this, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, is the right way to go. I know that it's, not, it's contrary to uh, the way we do things in the States, but I do like this a lot. Um, moving this out of the way, and I don't have to try and accommodate grills and crap. Mm -hmm. This is a good idea. I like that. Uh, the door looks like it could be used to uh, some help, but again, if this is an Alpha vehicle and that's yeah. the worst I can find, <laughs> uh, you're in pretty good shape. Well, there's another advantage for the cab forward. I mean, you, you can tell, you know, we have this structure on the back. You know, if you were to line this up next to a traditional U.S. chassis, I mean, the door is basically where you see yeah, that structure. Yeah, the back. And, yeah. you know, we are actually, even with this structure in the back, uh, forward to where the back of the cab would be on a right. day cab in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually have two of our, our hydrogen storage engineers here as well. Come, come on over. So based on the mobile fueler that we have here, um, yeah. what, what pressure are we going up to right now? So, yeah, so based on the two trailer we have, we can get up up to almost 170 bar mm -hmm. just through cascade 
Yeah. Mm. Um, right now we just finished three purge cycles um, and we're about to do the first fill. And then for our testing we will have mobile fueling solutions that go higher than that. It's still um, not that easy to get uh, mobile fueling solutions that go up yeah. to 700 bar and with the right fueling speed. That's why we're also um, working on that in-house. So we will build our yeah. own mobile fuelers. Um, for the purpose here where we want to do essentially the, the purge proce process and the initial fill, um, this is sufficient. And then at the testing sites, we will have 350, 500 bar and up to 700 bar um, down the road. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very and good. Do you know the details of the ballistic test? What's the oh, yeah. caliber? <laughs> what what uh, round did, did you fire round? into it? <laughs> uh, I believe it was uh, seven seven six um, three oh eight. That's a three oh eight. Yeah. Three oh eight. That's what I guessed. Yeah. And it, yeah or it's actually thirty out six for it took three oh eight or three. Shots two shots. Uh, yeah. Very good. By the way, if we turn around and have a look at those tanks over there. Um, you can see that these tanks, <clears throat> there's not nearly as much protection as what you uh, see here for the smaller tanks. And again, this one here was hit by a, these are the, you can find them on YouTube, hit by a train and you'll see these uh, tanks go flying all over the place, <laughs> uh, but nothing blows up and nothing gets, um, uh, nothing uh, explodes or what have you. So. Um, well, you won't the find hydrogen. our tanks flying around after. Yeah, no, <laughs> yours are going to be bolted in forever. <laughs> yeah. But so. this is something I wanted to mention maybe as a last point. When we said alpha and we're going to do some changes here on the vehicle. So a lot of the structure you see here is very, very rigid, which also yeah. means heavy. So we're in the process of lightweighting a lot of um, the structure here. We've already done um, multiple iterations of uh, essentially CAE in order to prove out the, the new design, yeah. lightweighted design. And we're also um, starting to test that. So as part of the crash tests that we uh, already did, we essentially tested um, on one side the alpha structure to verify our performance, especially once we go on the road and we go into custom operation. But then on the other side, we implemented a new structure. Yeah. Um, again, much lightweighted from what we see here. Mm -hmm. And then to prove out already early on yeah. that uh, we have a, you know, feasible and valid solution that meets our requirements. Another change that we will be introducing, even though this is a beautiful truck, um, we have started to elongate the front end of the truck, meaning we elongate the chassis a little bit, and that gives us more space in the front for wow. the cooling package. Mm. Um, mm. And with that, we can also have a little bit of a more aerodynamic shape. So we're pulling out yeah. the front, we're making it more aerodynamic. We keep the same structure of the cab, um, all of the steel, but we're essentially changing all of the panels around to optimize aerodynamics and to create more uh, space for the cooling package in the front. Well, based on my experience, see this right here? Replace it with small cameras. cameras. Uh, you want to you want to drop the uh, <laughs> drop the uh, or increase the range and drop the uh, the problems associated with aero. Yes. Get rid of them things. Yeah. And I, I don't I still don't have any clue why anybody in uh, in Nishta or wherever as to why they think that mirrors are a good idea. Yeah. They have to be adjusted continuously. Yeah. They are bad. Uh, they certainly don't go with the EPA uh, ideas. That's for sure. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. We just I don't know why the industry hasn't really gone there and pounded on the desk because yeah. those things are just like from the dark ages. Yeah. This is like hand signals in a car. I'm sure that people have to know it, but who does it? Nobody. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to uh, make some progress there. We've already submitted data. And we're hoping that we can, at one point, convince NHTSA to, yeah. to I, prove that. I think you're right. The commercial vehicle industry, I mean, Europe is going forward with yeah. allowing them. Yeah. There's, there's also secondary benefits because you can integrate it now with a security system. You can integrate it with ADOS. Yeah. You can do a lot yeah. of secondary things once you have the architecture right. in place with the yeah. video screens and the cameras that are only going to increase the safety and security of these vehicles. Yeah. It seems so obvious, and yet... I guess if you're, if that's your only job is uh, mirrors, I guess you're not going to give it up. So, okay, so let's uh, let's go back inside yeah. and have a look.